This week on Christian World News, from Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey, through his trial, crucifixion, and resurrection, we take you on a journey through Holy Week. Plus, it's one of the most sacred sites in the Holy Land. We'll go underneath the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to see what some believe is the tomb where Jesus rose from the dead. And is this the image of the crucified Christ? See how scientists are working with this ancient piece of cloth to discover clues about the resurrection. Welcome to Christian World News. I'm Mark Martin. We all know the Easter story from what the Gospels tell us of that earth-shattering week. Jesus came to Jerusalem, was crucified on a cross, and resurrected from a garden tomb. But our Paul Strand, a newcomer to Israel, recently saw those sites for the first time and reports on what he experienced. I moved here to Israel not long ago and thought it'd be interesting to experience Easter by visiting the places where Jesus lived, died, and rose again. The Easter week began at Beth Phage on the Mount of Olives. There, he mounted a young donkey to fulfill Zechariah 9.9. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. And on this day we call Palm Sunday, Matthew tells us, as Christ reportedly rode on this route, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest. But there are always critics and killjoys. Luke tells us some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Christ then entered Jerusalem triumphantly, though he soon began to raise a ruckus. This might be one of the areas near the temple where Jesus threw over the money changers' tables, saying, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And Mark tells us it was then that the religious leaders began to look for a way to kill him. Why? Because he was threatening a way of life that had made them wealthy. Several days later, for the Last Supper, Christ came to a room said to have been on this site. Breaking the bread and pouring the wine here with his disciples, he gave us communion, which we still take today. Jesus and the disciples then returned to the Mount of Olives, where he told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and all the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Then in the Garden of Gethsemane, he admitted, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He went alone to pray that this cup might pass from him, and he sweat tears of blood, a condition that supposedly only happens to those who know they are about to die. Then Judas appeared with an armed crowd and betrayed him with a kiss. And all his disciples fled and deserted him, just as he prophesied. Back in Jerusalem at a courtyard, some say this one, Pontius Pilate tried to save Jesus, but caved into a mob whipped up by the high priest into shouting, crucify him, crucify him. This is the Via Dolorosa, which marks Christ's tortured last walk the next day. So weakened from beatings, he fell beneath the weight of his cross. Some say that led to this area where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has reportedly covered Golgotha, the place where Christ was crucified. Others point to this hill outside the old city where many see a skull in the rock, and Golgotha does mean the place of the skull. You can make it out a whole lot better in these photos taken long, long ago. Skull Hill is also next to a garden with a tomb built into a wall, so this might well be the place where female followers of Christ showed up on Easter morning, only to be told by an angel, Do not be afraid. You come seeking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. But he is not here, for he is risen. In all the controversy about whether these or those are the actual spots where Jesus was, I've learned if you'll tune all that out and tune into the Holy Spirit, you'll feel how real all these events in Christ's last days were and that they really did take place right here in this city. And in the hubbub of daily life, where buses jam up against Skull Hill, where the Via Dolorosa is packed with people too distracted to think about God, I've come to appreciate all the more how vast his sacrifice to come down from glory into this world and love all these people too busy to notice him. And he died to save each and every one. After his resurrection, Christ was seen off and on by people for the next 40 days. And then many believe ascended from this side on the Mount of Olives, the same mountain where the Bible says he'll return in might and majesty. As Matthew says of those days, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The story's not over yet. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Mount of Olives. 
Thank you, Paul. For the first time in centuries, researchers have uncovered what some believe to be the tomb of Jesus inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's in the heart of Jerusalem's old city. And here's a story we brought you when a major restoration was done recently inside the 4th century church. This National Geographic video shows workmen uncovering the marble slab over the tomb on October 26th. As the video says, the modest tomb has never before been photographed and no drawings exist. It reported conservationists were surprised to find something their instruments didn't detect, a layer of debris beneath the marble cover. Then underneath the debris, they found another marble slab with a cross carved into its surface. Then they saw the original burial bed. Emperor Constantine ordered the church built in the fourth century. His mother, Queen Helena, came here to discover the tomb where Jesus was buried. The Roman Emperor Hadrian in the second century built a temple here to the goddess Aphrodite. The historian Eusebius said he did it to cover the tomb where Jesus was buried. The examination of the tomb is part of a restoration project. Workers are preparing the structure known as the edicule, which means little house. It was built to protect the tomb. The last repair work done on the edicule took place over 200 years ago. Professor Antonio Marapulu leads the restoration and told CBN News earlier this year about the project. We will uh, remove the marble slabs, the stone slabs. Uh, we will inject grouts to homogenize the complex structure, which is the holy rock. That means that uh, we develop a unified structure, that all the layers will behave structurally as one. And upon this, after um, repairing uh, with new compatible and performing mortars and concrete, we will readjust the stone slabs with titanium bolts. For the workers, it's more than a job. Vasilios Cephalis is a Greek civil engineer. So I'm very excited because I'm a Christian Orthodox and I am working in Greece in uh, monuments like this. But uh, this is a specialized project, very specialized project. I don't believe that I can go to something bigger than this. Each one of us in front of the Holy Tomb uh, feels the, uh, the values of the Holy Tomb. And the Holy Tomb is the most alive place in the world. It gives the message of resurrection. National Geographic plans to show more of its footage this month on its Explorer channel. The restoration should be completed sometime next year. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Jerusalem. Coming up, how new scientific procedures on a piece of cloth could provide clues to the appearance of Jesus. Welcome back to Christian World News. The burial cloth of Jesus, or a medieval forgery. The Shroud of Turin has generated controversy for hundreds of years. And now, as CBN's Gabe LaMonica explains, scientific evidence gives credence to the Shroud's authenticity. This is the story of a piece of cloth. Seen here rescued from a fire over two decades ago, surviving just the latest in a series of perils across a journey through history. The first gaze upon this mysterious relic resembles a Rorschach's test of damage dating back hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Zoom in a little closer, though. The stains are real blood. And the faint image of a tortured, crucified man comes into focus. Typical medieval portrayals of the crucifixion show the nails in the palms, but the palms wouldn't support the weight of the body. Look longer, and the serene face of that man becomes clear. It seems so peaceful in comparison to the violence that you see uh, all over the, the rest of the body. Brian Hyland is an exhibit curator at the Museum of the Bible. There have been questions about the veracity of this image uh, ever since its first documented uh, appearance in the 
late 14th century. In 1988, carbon testing dated the shroud back to medieval times. That test has repeatedly been called into question by various experts. The only single sample they took did not represent anywhere else on that cloth because it had been manipulated. Now, a new scientific procedure dates fabric from the shroud to roughly 2,000 years ago. That Italian study is just the latest in a long series of scientific testing, including studies of pollen plucked from the shroud with this scientific tape dispenser. The pollen samples that were uh, gathered, they, uh, a lot of them are from plants that are native to not just uh, the Middle East, but specifically the area around Judea, Palestine, uh, and uh, Syria, as it was in that time period. Um, there's also pollen uh, from the area around uh, Constantinople. There's a lot of pollen from Europe. The pollen samples suggest a journey of thousands of miles from Jerusalem through modern day Turkey and France and now Italy, where the artifact has been kept since the 16th century. Some say the cloth housed in the Turin Cathedral is a vessel for human blood and therefore may be nothing less than the Holy Grail. When you realize that the cloth is a vessel that's containing Christ's blood, I mean, there it is, and it is blood. And not only is it blood, it's type AB, which is the type that's consistent with Palestinian Jews. Still others call this bit of linen a forgery by none other than Leonardo da Vinci. We're saying it's a 500 year old photograph by Leonardo da Vinci. And if that doesn't sound crazy <laughs> enough, we're saying it's a 500 year old photograph of Leonardo da Vinci because he used his own face as the model, because that's the kind of thing he did. Authors Clive Prince and Lynn Picknett even put together their own experiments in an attempt to replicate the religious relic using a bust of the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius and comparing da Vinci's disputed Salvator Mundi painting to the image on the shroud. I'm no expert, but the shroud was being publicly shown 100 years before da Vinci was born. He was a good artist, but it wasn't that good. Barry Schwartz is a Jewish photographer based in Colorado who was called upon to photograph the shroud in the 70s. I was biased against it. And I even said somewhere along the line to somebody that yeah, you know, we'll get to Turin, we'll give us five minutes, we'll find the paint, we'll come home, we'll be done. Yeah, it's 44 years later. <laughs> and there was no paint, and it's not a painting or an artwork. No brush strokes, and another mystery. It's 3D. Scientists using an image analyzer revealed decades ago that the lights and darks of the shroud image translate into dimensional shapes. A normal photograph records only variations in light and does not record information about the distance the camera was from the subject. Now we'll put a picture of the shroud under the camera. This image is clearly recognizable. This can only be explained if the intensity levels of the shroud image itself are encoded with distance information from the cloth to the body. Now. British filmmaker David Rolfe is out with his fourth film, Who Can He Be?, investigating the Shroud of Turin, using the latest tech to digitally extract data encoded in the fabric, revealing a three-dimensional model of a man. We can see what I believe to be the body of the crucified Jesus in front of us on a piece of cloth, whereby the only way that that image could have got onto that cloth is a miraculous one, a miracle that emanated from the body um, with unbelievable amounts of energy, but with an infinitesimally short space of time. No matter the evidence, the Shroud of Turin may always remain a mystery. But for many, this mirror of the gospel, as Pope John Paul II called it, connects them to the divine. Gabe LaMonica, CBN News, Washington. Fascinating report. Up next, a visit to the site some historians believe might be the place where Pontius Pilate sentenced Jesus to death. 
Thanks for staying with us. These are busy days in Jerusalem as the city marks both Passover and Holy Week. Inside the old city walls, discoveries at Herod's palace have caught the attention of Jewish and Christian scholars. More than 2,000 years of history are recorded in one building where Pontius Pilate may have sentenced Jesus before his crucifixion. John Wagi explains. At the western edge of the old city, the Tower of David stands above the walls. 16 years ago, Archaeologists found a building while working on the Tower of David Museum. Records on its walls go back even before the time of Jesus and the Roman governor who sentenced him to the cross, Pontius Pilate. For years, experts suggested that Pilate handed down his death sentence from Antonius Fortress on the other side of the city where the Roman soldiers were housed. But recent evidence uncovered here at the site of King Herod's palace indicates that the luxury-loving Pilate was more likely to have pronounced judgment here. Archaeologist Amit Re'em helped discover the palace site in 1999. He's familiar with the history on these walls from Herod's time until the British put a prison on it in the 1940s. Until now, those impressive walls are the only remains from Herod Palace. We do not know what happened to the superstructures, to the palace itself. Maybe it was destroyed in the big revolt. Maybe it was destroyed by the Romans. Maybe it was destroyed by, by the Crusaders or the Ottoman. We don't know exactly where Jesus uh, was tried, where he had his uh, interview before Pontius Pilate, uh, but we know it's somewhere in Herod's palace. David Pelegi is pastor of Christ Church, just steps away from the site. We know that the palace of Herod the Great eventually became Roman property after Herod's death, and that every year Pontius Pilate would come from Caesarea to Jerusalem here during the time of Passover to oversee the security of the city during the festival that the Jews called the Feast of Freedom. And it was at this time where if there was going to be trouble in Jerusalem, it would be uh, during the past Passover holiday. Pelegi says that in a way, the Tower of David encompasses the entire life story of Jesus. Scholars have been saying for, for half a century that uh, the life of Jesus begins at the Tower of David or what was then Herod's palace. That's when the Magi come to visit King Herod. And his life ends basically when Pontius Pilate sentences him to death, pretty much in the same location. So there's some very interesting irony in this story. Israeli archaeologist Renee Sivan is still struck by its power and opulence, even though she helped begin the digging. Jerusalem is like an onion. You peel it, peel it, peel it, and it never ends. But then you, you cry a bit, but not, not too much. That is what happens here. Pelegi calls the Tower of David the best museum in the city and says tourists would do well to start their journey here. Now we have the extra bonus of uh, having the, the very place where Jesus was sent to execution by Pontius Pilate. And this will help Christians better visualize those uh, monumentous events that happened to uh, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, in the last week of his life. And just a couple of miles away, the Mount of Olives, where scripture says he'll come again. John Wagi, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, the spot that millions of Christians come to Israel to see and experience. That story when we come back. Every year, thousands of Christians come to Israel to get baptized in the same waters believed to be where Jesus himself was baptized. Chris Mitchell gives us a look at this ancient and special site. For Christians, being baptized in the Jordan River is a profound spiritual experience. Uh, because it's my dream and, and Jesus uh, was baptized here and we were blessed. I feel like I birth again because Jesus was baptized here. The site is called Qasr El Yehud. Israel developed this site for Christian pilgrims. And now about three quarters of a million people visit here each year. While there's no proof this is the exact location of the baptism of Jesus, 
it remains a special place. I read the Bible, I preach the Bible, and, uh, and for us to be here and actually experience it firsthand, it sort of underscores and uh, affirms what, uh, what they hear week after week uh, as we present God's Word to, uh, to the people. This is the area where some people believe the prophet Elijah ascended into heaven in a fiery chariot and where the children of Israel crossed over the River Jordan into the Promised Land. Tour guide Ben David Catriel gives two reasons why this might be the area Joshua brought the Israelites on their way to Jericho. There are passages on the Jordan, places that are easier to pass. That never changes, that's topography. But except that we have Jericho, that is no argument about the uh, location of Jericho. Actually, this is the first Aliyah that took place. This is a combination where the, the, the Bible or the stories of the Bible meet. Retired General Uzi Dayan says the Jewish people returned here from Egypt more than 3,000 years ago. Three millennia later, Jews are still returning to the land of Israel, where you can see biblical prophecies come to life. This can happen only here. You can't do that in any other country in the world. And if you believe in the book, so Israel is the best place for that. Come, make this part of your plans, because this will enrich your faith and deepen your uh, devotion to Jesus, which is what it's all about. For many, it's especially meaningful just before the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Chris Mitchell, Casa El Yehud Baptismal Site, the Jordan River. Well, thanks for joining us this week on Christian World News. Until next week, goodbye and God bless you.